for the opportunity. Yeah, so I'm Ed, I'm the sector coordinator for the Sites and Settlements Working Group, which is the sort of other name we have for the CCCM sector in Northeast Syria. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the CCCM and the general response situation in last resort sites. Uh, so there's a bit of context. Um, in Northeast Syria, we have approximately 285,000 individuals. Uh, in 265 last resort sites, uh, a mixture of sort of camps and formal settlements and collective centers. Uh, the population that are sort of residing in these areas um, have been displaced by different triggers uh, since the beginning of the conflict in Syria. Um, currently, uh, there's actually been no major displacement since late 2019 in Northeast Syria. Um, Prior to that, pre, pre late 2019, um, there's been multiple triggers from the civil war itself to uh, ISIS and then subsequent campaigns by actors to uh, uh, remove ISIS or an attempt to remove ISIS. Um, and then a couple of events, including the late 2019 event, um, being incursions into areas of Northeast Syria, um, resulting in mass displacement. Currently, um, in terms of displacement, we do still have some ongoing displacement, fortunately on a much smaller scale. Um, uh, majority of it, again, fortunately temporary. Um, in terms of temporary displacement, there was an attack on the prison in Haske uh, late, la early last year. We also had more recently um, the earthquake, which fortunately had minimal impact in Northeast Syria compared to that in Turkey and Northwest, but still did lead to some more temporary displacement. And then also um, on top of that, um, we've got still some, uh, some more permanent or long-term displacement, should I say, um, caused by still some conflict around frontline areas. Um, on top of that, also the econ economic situation being a driver uh, currently. Um, in terms of camps, so we have 12 camps in Northeast Syria, hosting approximately about 142,300 individuals. Uh, and we have two camp management agencies uh, providing uh, sort of CCTM activities within 10 of these camps, um, which also have a sort of local camp administration or authority-led camp administration working with them. And then we also have two camps uh, that actually have no camp management presence, but do have camp administration. Uh, in terms of the camps, I mean, we, we, we have a, uh, a massive, uh, well not massive, we, we, we've got a fairly large variety in terms of age of camp. We have some that have been there for, for or some that have been there prior to um, the, the civil war, war in, uh, in Syria. Um, Whereas we've got others that have opened more recently, um, the most recent of which opened after the, uh, the conflict escalation and mass displacement in late 2019. Um, and in terms of size of camps, we've got some, again, quite large differences. We've got one camp and the largest camp hosting roughly 55,000 individuals to the smallest camp probably hosting around two and a half thousand individuals. Uh, in terms of populations, we have quite a Quite a variety. Um, the majority are Syrian IDPs, um, but two camps also do host uh, not only IDPs, but also Iraqi refugees um, and also third country nationals, so foreign families that have been affiliated with ISIS, um, notably Al Hol camp and Raj camp here. And obviously, there within those two camps, that adds uh, an, another sort of security dynamic in these locations that do present more challenges, both for camp management um, and also for um, other uh, NGOs responding in those locations. Overall though, um, across camps, we do have uh, fairly regular multi-sectoral service provision. Um, there are, however, challenges on this. Um, we have quite large disparities often between the different camps in terms of level of service provided. Um, we also, as I think in many responses, are facing uh, challenges when it comes to decreased funding, impact and services. Um, that's obviously across the board, not just in camps. Um, 
Then we also have um, challenges with authorities regarding requests for expansions or for requests uh, for new camps uh, themselves. And then um, we also have, to some extent, duplication of services. And this duplication of services in some areas is, is as, a, as a result of uh, uh, a need for increased coordination between humanitarian actors, um, but also some uh, of these duplicated services um, are as a result of uh, some of the freedom of movement challenges that I highlighted um, related to the security dynamics in two of the camps. Um, but moving on to sort of informal settlements and collective centres, so 144 informal settlements, 109 collective centres, hosting in total around 141,900 individuals. These um, the, the, the overall split of population in these large resort sites is, is fairly even almost between those in camp settings but, uh, and those in these uh, more informal settings. Uh, as you can see from the, the map here, we, we sort of have clusters of informal settlements and collective centres, notably around sort of Pasika City, around Raqqa City, around Membij City, and then also uh, following following the path of Euphrates River um, down in Derizor. Overall, uh, in these sites, uh, we have a much reduced um, coverage in terms of services and certainly uh, a, lot, a lot less in terms of multi-sectoral services, uh, despite um, efforts uh, from humanitarian actors, but capacity challenges are obviously a, uh, one of a few factors that really challenge the ability to sort of uh, provide dignified services across all of these locations. Um, collective centers are predominantly uh, schools or were schools. Um, this in itself again provides a, a challenging dynamic where you have education facilities that are being used to host IDPs. Obviously collective centers are meant to be a, a temporary uh, solution. However, we have got multiple collective centers. In fact, the majority of collective centers that are schools have, have been uh, used to host IDPs for some up to five years. So uh, this obviously causes challenges when it comes to engagement with local authorities as well. And then we have informal settlements. Um, informal settlements, uh, the largest being uh, around 15,000 individuals, Salat al-Banat, one of the images there being shown, uh, gives an example of that. And actually just going back to the collective census, as you can see, some of them are also uh, heavily damaged uh, from conflict and so uh, are, are even less uh, dignified for those that are using them. Uh, in terms of challenges in these sort of last resort site settings, um, again, as I've already said, lack of capacity for there to be a, a comprehensive approach to meet needs, um, interference from authorities in terms of targeting, um, attempts to uh, move populations into camps or combining informal settlements. So an example of this being Adnaniya, proposed site in the top right, which is supposed to be the local authorities' uh, version of levelling ground. Um, the challenge we face here is that we have um, intentions from local authorities to relocate households. And uh, this is something that obviously goes against the ability of NGOs to to support it um, um, among, a, among a number of other challenges um, in that approach. Then on top of this, we have um, also just a removal of populations we have had in some collective centers uh, forced uh, or not, uh, we, we've had a lack of dignified departures of IDP populations from these, from these sites, therefore not only impacting um, the dignity and the rights of those IDPs, but also impacting the ability for NGOs to come in and support any form of rehabilitation of these sites afterwards um, in order not to incentivize further forced departures from these areas. Um, and obviously a major challenge across these sites is HLP. But I think overall, um, looking at um, both camps, informal settlements and collective centers, there's a, there's a fairly large theme running um, that is an overall challenge, and that is a lack of ability um, for many of these populations to return. Um, that could be due to inaccessibility to access areas of origin or threat of persecution 
um, and also a lack of economic opportunities in those areas. Certainly, for example, looking at Sarat al Banat, this example in the top left corner, um, this informal settlement is also located on a uh, rubbish dump, and that is used by the IDPs that reside there as a, as a form of uh, uh, livelihood. So opportunities. Now, there are some opportunities coming up. Some elements are beyond, I think, the control of humanitarian actors, um, such as returns, um, particularly when we're looking at returns to other areas of control or returns to uh, foreign uh, countries for those that are individuals that are not originally Syrians. Um, but again, there is also advocacy ongoing for those. But there are also opportunities that are within the humanitarian uh, ability to, to, to move on. Um, and these are quite heavily being led by camp management um, in, in the multiple camps. So one of them is improving coordination at site level. Um, there is massive work from camp management in attempt in, in working to deduplicate as possible and to advocate for, for freedom of movement in those specific camps I mentioned where there are challenges with this to deduplicate activities. Um, and to allow for partner capacity to be used elsewhere. Um, then also we have moves to try and change modalities at a camp level, um, basically to move away from in-kind assistance where possible and try and move towards other, other modalities to try and reduce the, 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 the pressure and the reliance on that, uh, on that quite heavy use of NGO uh, capacity. Uh, then at informal settlements and collective centres, similarly, there's, there's works to improve coordination there. Mobile CCM responses are something that are being uh, used. It's previously been used in Raqqa, and we have a new response starting in Haskell, um, just uh, just in the last couple of months. Um, and then also a final one, which is looking at alternatives to existing out-of-camp settings, particularly around those collective centres to begin with. Um, as mentioned, obviously, we have a number of challenges around the collective centres, and so this is a real area where we're, we're looking to, to see what can be explored. And we've even got a, um, a consultancy beginning in the, next, uh, in the next few weeks to look at the viability of this um, and to engage with all concerned stakeholders for that. Um, overall, though, I'd say it's a, it's a mixed picture. In Ness, we have some large challenges, um, but again, I think, as I said, we have got some approaches that can be taken and that are being taken to try and uh, to try and improve the response before it reaches any form of uh, crunch point. Um, I think overall, though, the strategy is still evolving and will continue to evolve depending on how the context is. Um, and the CCCM actors are certainly playing a key and major part in that. I think um, generally, and this is being often communicated without an effective camp management and CCCM response in camps, and without an effective overall response in camps, the ability to be able to improve the response out of camps that could enable for some of these alternatives to work and improve li livelihoods would be severely hampered. From my side, that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks for listening. But if you have any questions, then you can feel free to reach out to me there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. And I think it's, it's, um, it's definitely a great opportunity to us also to hear more about what's happening in Northeast Syria. I think we don't get that much um, chance to, to hear about the work. And I think it's, it's really interesting to also see how the range of work and, and scope of work that are, that is you know covered in that and the different modality and approach to what CCCM can do in that context. So best of luck and thank you so much for your time.